everyone, welcome to another episode um, on my channel, and I know this is in the colour chemistry series, but it's really kind of about paper. And my excuse is that actually, well, one's my YouTube channel and I'll stick it where I like, FNAF FNAF. And secondly, and more importantly, colour chemistry doesn't end at the tube. Obviously, how it behaves on the paper is important. And to understand how different colours behave on different papers is pretty critical, you know. Those of you who have done any watercolouring at all will know that if you put phthalo blue onto cotton paper that's slightly damp, it will travel miles, whereas ultramarine red won't go very far at all. So I want to look at sizing um, on papers and uh, have a think about what factors cause, um, or, or think about how that factor and the composition of the paper actually impact what we're doing. So. I'll show you the papers I've got today, and a lot of these are basically either what I've got, found around my studio, old samples I've been sent by companies, uh, just off cuts really. So, I've got a sheet of, actually we'll go in order. First of all, I've got some, I've tried, so first of all I'll just try and say, they're not all the same texture, so we've got to bear that in mind. I don't have every paper in every texture. I mostly paint landscape and seascape, so I usually paint on rough. Often cold press, never hot press. I use hot press for swatching and that is it because I hate it. First of all, Aquafine student grade hot press. This is a uh, cellulose um, chemical pulp paper, £140 hot press. It's torn out of a pad because I have such disdain for this paper that I couldn't even be bothered to use scissors. Next, I have Bockingford, which is also chemical pulp paper. This is £200 because it's a sample. It's what I had. I'm not going to cut a piece of Bockingford just for this. I had some samples. And it's a cold press. I have also got Langton. Now, this is not Langton Prestige. This is standard Langton, which is also a chemical pulp paper, £140. And this is the rough texture. I've got a non-watercolour paper, which is also um, cellulose pulp. So this is a Daler and Rowney mixed media paper from their Optima range, £169. Um, allegedly, you can use watercolour on this. I've used very wet acrylic on this and had no issue. I don't think it'll function very well with proper watercolouring, though, but we'll see. When we move over into the cotton pulp papers, or the rag papers, I have got Saunders Waterford from St Cuthbert's Mill, £200 cold press. I've got Langton Prestige, £140 rough, that's from Daler and Rowney. And uh, just to clarify, until about four years ago now, Bockingford used to be what Dana and Rowney used in their watercolour pads. They didn't sell it as Bockingford, they sold it as Langton, I believe. Um, it's changed now, it's a different paper, so Bockingford and Langton are no longer the same. And I think way back when that was the case, Saunders Waterford and Langton Prestige may have been the same, but I can't guarantee that. I've also got Alsh, £140 cold press, which is a French paper which is famed for its quite high sizing. And I've got Milford, £140 cold press, which is a really hard-sized paper. There is actually nothing like that on the market, as you will see. Now, my big question today is not actually about texture of surface. It's does size matter? Now, in the context of watercolour, yes, it does. In other areas of one's life, couldn't possibly say. So, let's start by putting out some papers. And I'm going to tell you about the, te the little test that I'm going to do on them just move my crap i think what i'll probably do is do these in batches because my work area is not enormous and um we'll see how that goes but i'm just going to put them on i'm not doing them in any order at all i'm actually going to try and get all of the uh yeah i can do them that way i can get all the sort of um chemical pulp four out of the way first then we'll move on to the cotton so what I'm going to do with them all is get them wet first of all and then I'm going to apply some colour and we're going to see that colour move and then we're going to leave the paper and let it dry completely naturally and we're just going to see how it looks afterwards so brush wise I'm going to be using a proline plus size 12 really gorgeous brush that's actually a bit stained I won't use that one because I don't know if that's staining or whether it needs washing. I'll use this size 10 because I've just cleaned it. It's a travel brush um, by ProArt with a 
lewd shaped um, holder. Really, really nice brush. And I don't usually use size 10 brushes. I usually use 8s and 12s. But I've really started to like this. It's kind of a nice in-between. I'm finding myself not needing to change the brushes in the middle of working. And to wet the paper, I'm using a 1-inch Proline. So this is not Proline Plus. The difference is that normal Proline is very soft, very hair-like. Proline Plus is stiffer, and it's a mixture of different filaments together to give um, a much more like Kalinsky effect. This is like Sable, this is like Kalinsky. That's the best way I can describe it. Pop those other brushes to one side because I'm filming multiple videos today and I will need those later. And the paint I'm going to use is going to be a French Ultramarine from Dayla and Rowney in their large pans. And if you go down there to the link over to my website, you will see that you can buy all the supplies I've used in this video, all the different paper types, the paint, everything is over there. So I'm just going to take my pipette and use that to apply some water to the surface of the paint just to get it going really because I want to be able to apply water. Once I've wetted the papers I want to get water onto them with reasonable rapidity and what I like about pans like this size is that you can get a lot of paint mixed up really quickly and it channels around the edge of the pad or the pan, so you can recharge your brush very easily. So, we'll start by wetting the paper, and I'm going to do it the way I wet paper normally, which is that I'm going to wet it, and then I'm going to let it soak in, and then I'm going to come back to it. And I'm doing this absolutely the way I would normally wet paper when I'm painting. No different at all. And I use that much water because I'm used to painting on a cotton paper. So I can get away with that much. These papers probably won't cope too well. But that's part of the test is to see how they perform when they're challenged with a decent wash. What I'm interested in looking at is how they perform in terms of what the colour does. If you use a paper with hard sizing like Milford or to an extent Arsh, what you will find is that the colour doesn't actually go downwards into the paper, it sits on the surface. And that's really nice because it means you get a very, very, very vivid colour that also lifts really easily for weeks. Okay, so those are all nice and thoroughly wetted and now I'll start and I'll start at the same order I applied them in, I'm just going to do a line of colour, a line of colour and a dot. A line of colour, a line of colour and then a dot. The purpose of doing that is it will help us see how far it diffuses. You know, if you're a sort of follower of handprint.com or anything like that, you'll be telling me off because I haven't applied exactly the same amount of paint in exactly the same wash to every single sheet. Now, I am not here to be handprint on YouTube. Uh, I don't actually agree with everything um, or the philosophy behind handprint, which seems to be that every paint manufacturer is fibbing to you and you have to test everything yourselves. Um, I'm not quite so cynical as that, and I'm also not so bothered, because remember, people worry a lot about their pa Oh, these paints aren't light fast, I can't possibly use them. One, are your paintings really going to be hanging in the Louvre for the next 200 years? Probably not. If you're just making paintings for your family and friends, it's really not worth you worrying that much about light fastness. And secondly... Remember all the paintings done by the old masters that survived for hundreds and hundreds of years and look okay. I mean, they've been restored a bit, but they look fine. They never had light fast pigments until the 1800s. So all the yellows they used were gamboge, which is not light fast at all. Real gamboge. They used a lot of paints that were not light fast. Opera Rose, as it now stands, which is the notoriously non-light fast vivid pink, is actually more light fast than real gamboge and real gamboge was in use hundreds of years ago and okay it hasn't always survived but in many cases it has and I find it hilarious when people test watercolour light fastness by hanging it in front of absolute direct sunlight for weeks 
and then go after a year, go oh, look, it faded, the manufacturers are lying. Well, actually, no, they weren't. No sensible person hangs a painting in direct sunlight. The manufacturer's tests are done based on the typical amount of paint a fine art painting will get when it's been left in a normal kind of environment. So you can see there's a little bit of spread going on here, and I'll just talk you through them. Aquafine has kind of stayed where it is. Bockingford has moved, but not a lot, but it will move later. This mixed media paper hasn't moved much, but it has spread a little bit. Langton has kind of behaved a little bit more like a cotton paper, and it has actually soaked across. I'm going to move these to one side now, and I'm going to keep them all separate and all flat, and you're going to have to take my word for that. And we'll come back and look at these when they've completely naturally dried, because I don't believe in heat drying paint ever because um, as far as I'm concerned one of the beauties of watercolour is how it dries you know the, that act of spreading and you kind of shortcut that when you heat dry so I personally prefer not to do it you may do it I also never iron my clothes and I fold things flat from the tumble dryer some people don't like doing that I do you know we're all different people and if we were all the same we wouldn't need supermarkets life would be awfully different so what I've got out now are Milford, Saunders, Waterford, Langton Prestige and Alsh. And just to give you an, an idea of the order of the kind of intensity of the sizing of these cotton only papers. Really, I would say they kind of go in this direction. These two, possibly three, these three are the ones with the really good sizing. This one isn't quite so good. I'd say these two are the really premium sized papers. And Milford, you'll actually probably see when I put water on it, it will actually bead up. It won't actually go into the paper like the others will. It's a very, very different paper. It's almost like painting on Upo to some extent. So you can, I don't know if you can see, there's actually a bead of water there, and that will stay there. That won't go away. It will actually stay as a film of water on the surface, and that will give us a very, very special experience when painting on it. Now, because these are cotton papers, I would normally let the water soak in just a moment, just until it goes shiny and ceases to pool on the surface. However, Milford is not going to do that. So what I'm going to do instead is pop it on and brush it in, basically. As the brush gets drier, I'm just sort of using it to push the paint, the water into the page. Milford has stayed on the surface, Langton Prestige has soaked in, Saunders Waterford has more or less soaked in and Arsh will soak in by the time I get back to it. Some of you will be screaming this is not a fair test but believe me um, every paper is different and I'm kind of trying to do this in the way that best suits these more specific papers. So a line, a line and a dot. You can see the surface of that paper is soaking wet. I'm running out of water on my brush a little bit here. The reason I'm going back over these lines is that my brush is a little bit drier than I would like, but I'm trying not to put gallons of water out either. What happened is in between some paint dried on my brush a little bit, so it was a bit hard to re-wet. I don't know if you can quite see it, but on the Milford there are almost like what would be called a spider navus or navi, a birthmark that's got sort of little thread veins around it. Um, it almost looks like that in the middle, and I don't know if you can quite make that out. If I can maybe move this, it's important you see it while it's wet really. It's hard to move it because it's got wet paint on the surface wet w and wet water, not that there's any other kind, <laughs> on the surface. And I'm going to have to move it very, very carefully. Right, can you see there is a bead of water there? So it's got a pool of water on it and you've got this sort of navus like pattern in the middle. Absolutely amazing paper. I'm going to move that completely off camera and put it on a shelf where I can guarantee it won't get knocked and let the others move just a moment on their own. I will be back. Oh no, hang on.
I've got a space on my shelf above my painting area because that one actually has a pool of water on the surface rather than just a wet surface if I lifted it even slightly everything would slide off and that could be rather interesting Arsh similarly has got water beads on the surface none of the others really have done that to quite that extent I love that water but is that not just beautiful you get such wonderful depth with it and it reminds me a lot this sort of pattern you get of if you put gum arabic onto the surface of paper and then you put paint along the edge you get these sort of tree like looks like reflections of trees almost you get the same sort of pattern but but uh waterford does that on its own i am keeping all of these fairly flat i'm not being perfect about it because uh, again, part of the art of watercolour is letting things move around. So I'll just take those off camera. And what I'll be doing is coming back later today when they've all dried down and then we'll talk through them and I'll show you a bit of lifting perhaps and we can discuss the relative merits of them and their levels of sizing because it is important to use paper that's appropriately sized for the task you're doing. And the effects you want may not be possible on the premium papers. They may not be possible on the cheap papers. You have to basically use the right tool for the job, as one always should. Thank you all very much, and I'll see you shortly. Hi, I just wanted to kind of do a little add-on to the um, comparisons of paint that I did on papers with different levels of sizing that... Um, there's actually several days since I filmed it, but let's go back in time. Let's just take Arches here versus Milford. And I just want you to see... Can you see how much more intense and bright the colour is here? It's still bled and it's still spread. This is actually bleed where it's spread out, but it's kept vibrancy. Whereas here, it works its way down into the paper, so you don't see as much of the colour. But on Milford, you keep it. And that is why Milford is so wonderful, especially for sea and sky. And I just want to show you some sky I painted on Milford by just spotting on some phthalo sapphire onto wet paper and letting it run. And I got this most wonderful sky. And I've had really photographic effects before now um, by throwing it on. And this one's got this kind of desert underneath it that I'm going to be building a butte here on the horizon and kind of adding to. That's a little study that will make a proper painting at a later date. And I may as well show you Saunders Waterford now. It's had a proper, proper dry down over a couple of days. That again, you can see the vibrancy and the intensity on Milford on the right is just so much stronger. Same amount of paint, just a totally different sizing on the paper. So thank you all very much. Good evening.